Hi, today I've got something really exciting for you. I've got a guest that I'm going to be interviewing. He's really one of the most experienced and capable business leaders in America, maybe in the whole world. A re really amazing leader. He was a, he's the lead director of Palo Alto Networks, uh, chairman of NSTAC here in the US. Uh, he's a director over at Lockheed Martin. And he spent 12 years at AT&T, culminating as the CEO of AT&T Communications. Before that, he was group president, um, and, and he was the CTO. He's um, just an amazing guy. He was my boss for quite some time. It's John Donovan. And I'm really excited to talk to him today. We're going to ask him about cybersecurity and business and telecom. And I just can't wait to hear what John has to share. So I hope you'll stick around. And here's my interview now with John Donovan. So I'm here with John Donovan, who is one of America's great business leaders. I think you could argue one of the globe's great business leaders and an incredible inspiration to me. I've been looking forward to this so much, John. Uh, thanks for joining and I'm looking forward to talking to you. Thanks, Ed. Uh, appreciate it. I also was looking forward to it. It's been a little while and uh, we had a lot of good years together. So it's, it's wonderful to see you and see you vibrant and healthy. So. That's great. You know, in the intro, I shared uh, with folks the, your very long career so far, all the amazing things you've done. When you reflect back, what, are there a couple of highlights that jump off the page where you say, man, that was something. What, what, what do you think of when you uh, reflect back? Well, you know, I, I was always uh, careful along the way to like try to live in the moment, which then allows you to go back and have a lot of placeholders that were in the moment because it, it who would have known it's sort of like the, the memories of a camera that would take pictures of this. And I would often tell people, let's all stop for a minute and think about this. So when you, when you look at it, you know, the, the jump when I left a career to go to a startup was, was seminal because I was not only going into a whole new way to get compensated a whole new risk profile. It was a new city, a new location, a new team. Um, that was sort of the, the first trauma when you go back and say, that was a pivotal moment in my life because what I learned to do was to go into an entirely new environment, trust yourself to recalibrate and, and, um, and get back to like who you are. The second thing is when I made the decision to go from Silicon Valley to AT&T. And um, I had several people bet me. And so I bet I had a Garmin computer for my bike that I had won. I had a case of wine that I had won. I, 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 made, I bet people that I would survive and, and live there and actually enjoy it. Because it really was about expectation. So going from sort of structured to unstructured, from small to big, those were seminal events in my life. And then I think the, the third one was having the bird's eye view with the launch of the iPhone. And that's one that certainly we shared. Yeah. And no one at the time, you know, when you go back and you look at the iPhone one and two and three, and you have stories and narrative around each of them, um, you all of a sudden are somewhat of a, an industry and technology historian whether it's inadvertent or whether it's intentional, whether you were an observer or participant, it was a ringside seat. However you wanna look at it, you were there for the fight of the century, if you will. Um, and if you recall, I used to just tell people, remember this moment, because you're gonna go back and you're gonna say, that was a moment where it not only changed the trajectory of, of, uh, of technology, it changed, you know, the, many industries, um, all of software, telecommunications, you know, uh, the mobile phone business. And so, you know, those, those sorts of, those, those stick out to me. And then I guess the, the last one, and you're probably in the same situation I am, when you start to look at kids and grandkids and you realize like, what, how does the family impact this? It's way more bound up in the, um, in the your technology and your life affect how you work and those become seminal moments because you start to have a different perspective about um, 
longevity, heritage, legacy. Those, those don't mean anything when you're starting out. They mean everything when you're you know, checking out. So um, it, that evolution is certainly an important one as well. So uh, probably a longer list than you expected, but a lot of moments that were kind of, I think, special and transformative for me. You know, your point about the iPhone transforming so many industries, I watched that and I, you, you had an amazing ability to kind of connect the dots. I always thought that was a strength that I saw in you that I hadn't seen too many other people where you could look at this and that and, and somehow connect it. And, and I always thought in telecom, you in particular were one of the pioneers that, that brought telecom into the modern era, really making software the basis for what we were doing. I wonder as you, re, again, reflecting back on yeah. telecom, and I know you're still very much involved in, in the industry, certainly the NSTAC and the other things you're doing. What, what do you think about telecom right now? Like when you're when ask them, what's the status? What's the posture of the industry? Is it in a position of strength? Are there some, some weaknesses you see? What, what are your thoughts on telecom in 2022 and beyond? Yeah, I think that um, at, at one point in time, you know, the, if you were geeking out and you go back to the old OSI stack, you say, okay, you have these layers of the networking, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And, um, you know, you have the physical construction and you work your way up and each person at each level that, that was the leader in that level um, sort of had a comfortable swim lane, if you will, and so those things that 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 stacking made things really nice and convenient. And then uh, internet protocol comes along, and then all of a sudden, what's the difference between a switch and a router? And a switch was the complicated things that telecommunications did, and a router was these generic things everybody bought everywhere um, that that sat in this place in the network or that place in the network. So I think that what's happened is these bright yellow lines uh, blurred into gray, and then everybody could do everybody else's business. So almost every day I wake up and I look at that industry, I look back in the rearview mirror, um, not for direction. I like to live with a big windshield and a small rearview mirror. But when you look back to say, okay, which things are happening, the 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 convergence of industries continues to happen. Um, here we are on a, a video call today that, you know, 30 years ago, you'd say, well, we're gonna do video calls over a wire and people would say, surely that's gonna be done by AT&T and Verizon and those folks. And yet alone, now we're gonna do it on a mobile phone and it's gonna be, you know, Zoom or WebEx or, you know, so, so the number of participants is increasing, the complexity is increasing. The historical view helps you understand where brand permissions um, happen, where evolutions happen. But I think that what's really exciting is you can take any point in time, today being one of them, and say, going forward, can I build something from scratch that's transformative? And the answer is yes. So you can do that whether it's an application, you can do that whether it's infrastructure, you could do it whether it's a network. So the real trick is, you know, when, where, and how do I adopt this technology? Because as I always said, picking the technology is the easiest part. Picking the timing is the hardest part. If you do the, if you put them together, you know, you end up with magic, but it's really hard. You are always good at both. I wonder, what do you think of 5G? Do you, are you excited about 5G? Do you think- well, I think many- well yeah, I think many people think of 5G as the next G, and I don't think it is because, um, you know, it, it, if you were to look and say it, 4G, does it work as 3G? No. Does it, you know, material affect wireline networks? No. Um, so when I look at 5G, 5G affects everything. It's a wired technology um, uh, implication. You say, well, what is different about it in the traditional terms of is it faster? Is it more secure? You know, those sorts of things. Is it more spectrally efficient? The wireless component looks like the next G, it's 4G to 5G, and you get a bunch of evolved capability. But, but what it does is that you hit important thresholds. So it's highly distributed. Prior ones weren't, they're were hierarchical. It's open. It's more software based. More people will innovate on it. It's um, it's real time. 
So all of a sudden, you know, what used to be the cloud is now on the edge. So you move the cloud to the edge. So all of those things, this is like fundamentally different. It's the security parameters are different. What you can do is different. So yeah, it's faster and it's more secure, but more importantly, it's distributed, it's real time. And I can now architect my life entirely differently. So industries are gonna move. So I used to think, Ed, that every 10, 15 years, the pendulum would swing. It swings centralized mm -hmm. um, in order to uh, be efficient, then decentralized for um, innovation and growth. So not many people think of the cloud as centralization because I move things from my, my facility to yours. There was a big movement there, but it was a centralization and that utilization sharing and sort of the early days of it's just shared compute. Um, we're gaining most of the benefits of centralization. And I think the swing back to decentralization is gonna be as important as the move from you know, mainframe to PC, PC back into mid-range, then mid-range into mobile. And so um, this is a big pendulum swing, it's a big deal. And I think it will be um, something that will be the foundation that will change your industry, whether you recognize it or not. Better to be on the giving end than the receiving end in that case. I would agree. Now, John, I want to go in a different direction and talk about boards. You, you've sure. had just about every vantage point one could have with respect to boards, advising them, sitting on big ones, dealing with boards. Maybe that's the least uh, enjoyable of the three. But um, curious what you think about the whole board sort of system, um, say in, in America, you, you think things are working, do boards, are they effective in their role? I'm, I'm sort of asking you to step back and look at, um, you know, a long career of dealing in this area. I'm curious what you think about the- Yeah, so you, I, I think for the most part, it's extremely effective. And I think the last five years, you know, my first public board, I think I joined 22 years ago or something, but, um, and I've seen them evolved. And I think that when you, know, the, when you gain a diverse set of experiences and everybody's friendly, um, that you, you end up you know, dissolving your diversity um, into, um, into friendship and the friendship thing you know, sort of carries more clout. I think that the governance has evolved to where the, the diversity of boards is now central theme. And I think what gets lost is like tenure diversity. Every board should have new people who are asking questions that you, you know, you jokingly say it's a dumb question, but everybody had it. What does that mean? Why are we doing it that way? So you start to look at these things and you, you know, when, when it started out, you would have folks that kind of knew each other, did business with each other. They were different business in different businesses, but now I think we're more thoughtfully constructing boards. So the construction of the board is different and I think it's better. I think the structure of boards in like committees, for instance, and we're gonna talk about cyber, you know, I, I think the, that we're starting another turn of the crank on redoing committees saying, cyber used to be the purview of a chief security officer who sat you know, underneath the CIO to where now, it, and they reported the board once a year, now we're gonna find committee structures just around cybersecurity. The evolution of that is you know, an example of how the structures evolve over time. I think that that's, that's better. And I think that evolution has happened. And then the third one, which I think is a really important one, is I think board dynamics have changed over time. Um, I'll use a, a sports analogy. It used to be the off season was for rest and the preseason was to get in shape. And now, and then you have the season and there's no preseason. So what I've seen now is with the dynamics of boards and process and structure changes, the preparation requirements are much higher than they used to be. And that allows you to be more effective and more engaged. So I think boards um, and particularly the evolution of boards, we've always thought it was important to have governance outside the company to challenge what's happening. Um, 
but I think the, the last five years, certainly in getting, you know, many different types of diversity, enterprise, consumer, I mentioned tenure, you know, color, gender, industry, we have, we have a much more robust view of that. And, and the friendships they develop, but they're secondary. Um, they become important to the dynamics of the board, but not the construction of the board. And I think that difference is the fundamental difference in the improvement that I've seen. You know, a very special board that I know you've been uh, chairing for three years is NSTAC. I wonder, when you add that government component, does that change the equation a little bit? I would imagine the meetings you have as a director at Lockheed or at Palo, I'm guessing a little different than the kinds of things that go on at NSTAC. What, what, what's your thought on those kinds of boards, like those government uh, kinds of things? Yeah, I think that they're uh, necessary. I think it's a, a service um, responsibility. Um, so let's put it in the category of duty. Um, and I think they're unique. And I think that though, much like going from a startup to you know, a large company as a CTO, it's about expectation. So what do you expect when you go sit down? And so you expect that things you know, might be more rigorously thought out. You know, yes, it's gonna be more democratic in its approach, yes. It's gonna be more transparent in its reporting requirements, yes. And so I always, um, uh, you know, in the chair of, of NSTAC, and I think I've been on it for roughly 10 years, I I'm often remind people, hey, we're gonna get to, just like a political process, we're gonna get to a midpoint that works, let people come and promote their view of the world. But if you don't get everybody speaking, you don't find that midpoint at which everybody is either equally happy or you could say equally unhappy, but that part of it means that we have to have the right diversity at NSTAC, big company, small company, services, product, hardware, cloud, application, you know, network. And then you put all those opinions together and you can usually forge things that are, that are pretty effective. The last thing I'll say about it is um, it's been a little bit of a pleasant surprise, but a surprise nonetheless, is the gravity of your work matters. You're supposed to, you know, pick subjects and address those subjects that are strategic, presidential, um, and so on. And therefore, these things tend to have shelf lives that are way longer than I expected. I'll run across a reference here and there to a meeting and, you know, an NSTAC report that was done nine years ago on resiliency, you know, right after Hurricane Katrina. And, and, and those things still ring true today. So, um, there is a gravity to them and I remind people that, hey, we're not just pushing a deliverable through here and trying to navigate a process where everybody gets input. We're doing something that mirrors the, the democracy that we have as a government. And that is, we're, we've got a lot of voices, they're diverse. We're gonna hear everybody out. We're gonna make sure we do high quality work that we think can live a, you know, a decade if it needs to um, in a subject area that's both strategic and important. So uh, it's been it's been an honor for me. I don't want to say anything different. It, it really is. It's nice to go into the White House to go to a meeting. It's you know it's got a high cool factor, um, but it it it's also really important stuff to do for the country because I think if we don't um, think about values and like freedom and independence and democracy and transparency in our work, then um, we, we can sometimes forget why we're doing it. It's great that you do that. Sometimes when people are talking to me, and sometimes people will question the value of those groups. I often say, well, look who's chairing this one, NSTAC. Like they, I, I often wonder if they understand you know, how valuable it is to have you there helping. So I'm so glad you're uh, there helping. Now, let's go from NSTAC to related topic, your favorite topic and mine, cybersecurity. This is... Um, been a hell of a ride, hasn't it, the last 20 years? I, I remember calling you at midnight and saying, John, I think this is a nation state. And for me, that was kind of new because you didn't have that in the 90s into the, the early 2000s. Was hackers, you know, a bunch of hackers coming after you. What, what's your observation? You've been at this a long time. I'm just curious, like from a threat perspective or 
There's some things keeping you up at night. I mean, you and I have been comparing notes on this a long time. What, where's your head on cyber right now? Yeah, you know, I think that um, it's interesting when I contemplated our discussion today, I thought, okay, let me go back in my own mind to my first conversations with Ed and, and then think about how the industry has evolved since. Um, and it went from, you know, um, hijinks to higher education. You know, it, 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 it went from, it went through the phase of doing it for um, intellectual property, uh, for money, for further, furthering, you know, political and ideology. It went from networks to network infrastructure to applications. Uh, it went from wired to wireless. Um, and so it went from people to things. It went from social engineering to, you know, um, AI and machine learning. It went from open air grabbing to, you know, encrypted VPNs. So everything that gets built today, its highest and best use will be in defense of uh, illicit use. So it's almost like everything that's new is now a cybersecurity attack surface or a cybersecurity solution. Um, so you have to be current on everything in the domain of technology because everything is potentially a window, a door, an unlocked window or an unlocked door. Um, and that has to be part of the construction of everything we do. So, um, you know, we, you, you look as a historian and, you know, you mentioned calling at midnight saying, I think this is a nation state. You also one time presented to me the concept of saying this went from a beginner's game to really advanced calculus. Um, then when we saw, you know, DDoS attacks went from, you know, heavy load to fast packet. You know, we spent a whole summer trying to keep networks up. And you think about th those are now sort of trite attacks that everybody knows exactly what to do with. And if you're, you know, if you're, if you're missing them, then you, you know, but so it's really moved into the attack surface is whatever the most advanced thing is. So it's interesting because cybersecurity is no longer a thing. So I used to describe networks as, as um, oxygen, that it's invisible when it's working at its best and it's only evident when it's not there and then it becomes choking. Um, cybersecurity becomes the clean air. It's not, it's not the oxygen you breathe, but it is the, the cleanliness of the air that you breathe. And so everybody wants it to be invisible. Nobody likes passwords. Nobody likes complex passwords. And so it's been really interesting. It's a little bit like uh, radar detectors and VASCAR and radar detectors. You know, like, you know, there's the, the uh, prevention and the, there's the detection and then there's the illicit use. And I just watch it and everything I read now, you st it starts to taint everything. Oh, well, that's going to be a problem. The attack surface grows as a result of that. This is going to be something no one's thinking about security on. So it becomes sort of like a cynic's view of the world if you're not careful. You know, one of the um, things that's impressed me is the work you've, you've done at Palo. I and mean, our joint friend, Nerzak, you know, starts this company. And you guys have always seemed to have a pretty good uh, barometer for where things are going, like um, the transition from next generation firewall to cloud. Kind of, Palo was one of the first companies really that figured that out. I'm curious sitting on the board there, that must have been pretty interesting because that's um, the vendor community is different than where you and I were in protecting infrastructure, very blue collar in a sense, you know, trying yeah. to keep things up. But over at Palo, different game, you know, you're swimming with the sharks there. That's where you've got to be four steps ahead in the chess match. Uh, how, how, how have you, again, when you reflect on that, it seems like that must have been pretty darn exciting to, to think that stuff through. Um, am I reading that right with Palo? Yeah, you know, it, it's, I'm coming up on, I think, or maybe I just passed a decade with them. Um, so I'm on the, uh, from a board perspective, I'm the longer tenure there. 
whereas at Lockheed Martin, I'm the newest tenure. Um, so it's really uh, interesting. So in that one, you know, you bring up some good points. If you look over the course of a decade, um, we have an entirely new asset base. We have an entirely new management team. And, and if you look process and procedurally, everything is a new. So I liken it to, you know, um, it's really easy in, if you have an old wooden boat and every year you do a repair and 10 years later you look and you say, not one single thing is the same uh, as when I started, is that the same boat? And there is the continuity which says, yeah, it is. We're evolving and it's, it's not a revolution, it's an evolution. Um, that's kind of how you look at it. And I would say the one thing that uh, uh, Nikesh has done a great job of is make sure that we're always looking on, at the horizon line. And I think as a board, you know, it's funny you say we were early into cloud. We, at the time, we felt late into it. Now, the reason you feel late into it is we just view every event on the horizon as worthy of observation and every credible team as worthy of monitoring. So where we couldn't keep pace, we would acquire, but we never sat and said, oh, eventually we're gonna to get to that and ours will be better. You look and you say, if it's, a, if it's a credible need, they're solving a problem, it's a great team on it, then it's a real thing. And it may be new and small, but it's real. And I think we, from that, we have built what I'll call uh, a platform for security that we can you know, continue to build where it makes sense to acquire and integrate where it makes sense. And we don't really have to choose a long-term um, vision for which of those we must do. And I think that that was an important transition we made. So I, I, I applaud the, um, the leadership team there for doing an amazing job of knowing what are false positives on the horizon and knowing what's signal and jumping on the things that are signal and letting the noise fade. And um, it's, been a, it's been a good run. It's been very interesting and it's been an exciting thing to be part of. Now, one of the things you're doing now is you're running an investment group. And I'm, I'm curious as you sort of scan the, um, the landscape, and I, 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 I understand it's a machine learning, artificial intelligence kind of focus, but maybe you can give a little bit more background on that. But what sorts of things do you look for when, when you're uh, making investments? You've had such a long career and so many different perspectives. The, yes. Does all that come to play or is it really just about, you know, who can be the most innovative? What, what do you usually look for? Well, uh, you know, I look at my own life and say there's, um, there's three phases. There's the phase where I built technology, the phase where I bought technology. And then this phase will be about investing in technology. And, and then the nature of where I want to invest is not about necessarily making money. I think if you do it well, that's a byproduct, not a goal. Um, it's about finding the new areas, finding the entrepreneurs and sharing with them, you know, the meaningful guidance uh, of what you learned over your career without trying to sound brilliant and make everything look like a problem you've already seen. So the hardest part is to stay current and not get grounded in. I remember back, you know, when, when I was doing this, or this looks exactly like that. And, and those are dangerous uh, dating mechanisms that there is distinct to um, uh, a young founder as a 50s architecture home is. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, you're, you're, you put a timestamp on yourself. So what I've done is I've said, okay, well, where, where am I interested? Where do I think I can help? And then, you know, is that a good place to invest? So I've landed on um, AI and machine learning, certainly some early stage cyber stuff where it doesn't conflict. Um, and more importantly, what I found, Ed, is that um, where I invest, I advise to give better advice. Uh, where I, you know, I always, always say that, you know, a mentor gives you drive-by advice. An advocate tells you the things you don't want to hear, goes in a room and says, you can bet on it at Amoroso and I'm as, and, and you can, if it doesn't work, it's on me. 
that's an advocate. So I kind of look at it this way and say, okay, this an advisor, an investor, when you put those two together, you're a partner. And that's what I've tried to do. And so I think I've got 15 or 16 investments now I feel really good about. There's a couple that I think are going to be important for the world in healthcare, but they are really deep in technology. So I tried to go on the the leading edge of technology, just shy of the bleeding edge. The bleeding edge, difference between the uh, leading edge and bleeding edge is blood, of course. But um, you know, you just want to make sure that at the point you're you're betting on something that looks like a company. So I've sort of not gotten into science. As tempting as it is to spend time in quantum physics and companies are forming there, it's more about the science than it is about the commercialization. So I've sort of have stayed in that early stage, but the focus is commercialization. So I start when there's something that works and we know that it works. And then how do you form it, position it, sell it, you know, make it happen. So, so that's where I focused. And, and, you know, my, my hope, like most people is that um, you're making a difference and you're helping and that, that I won't sit here and tell you, you know, what the ROI is on the investments that it's more about, Hey, look what the cool thing these guys are doing. So John, I was wondering if you'd take a few minutes and just share with us a little bit about Sunday security. So I know you've been involved with them and I know you're excited about their approach. Can you just tell us a little bit about the company and your involvement and what, what you think are their prospects for the future? Yeah, I, I met Sunday um, through some friends in the cybersecurity space that really know their way around. And, you know, I, I, I operate, as you know, from certain theses. You know, I have a a th thesis that AI and machine learning is going to exhaust its benefit after we get through optimization. So high performance computing is going to come back and chips are going to become way more important and less commoditized. And, you know, more of those are going to be manufactured in the U.S. So you, you kind of look for something, you say that really fits with, with where I'm thinking about it. And we talked earlier about the landscape of cyber shifting dramatically and so one of the things that's always been troublesome to me as an executive and even as um, a family uh, around the executive and then as an investor, and that is one of the most vulnerable attack surfaces is people's private lives and their family. And so, you know, I liken it to, you know, we can all read stories about how a Facebook post or a Twitter tweet have cost people reputational risk, you know, because of loose, loose choice of words or letting something come in out of context. Well, we also have promiscuous computing habits at times, you know, around those sorts of platforms. And so what used to evolve from, hey, let me social my social engineer my way into a system and try to, you know, lift a check for $10,000 out of this company has now become really advanced. And as you taught me, persistent and threatening. That's why they call it an advanced persistent threat because these are really smart people who are willing to take a very long period of time with the right target to build um, a, 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 an opportunity. And the biggest vulnerability that's not been covered is around the personal lives of executives and their families where they don't have an IT department supervising them, making their change their passwords and picking a good password and all that. So I felt like, you know, that was something that someone needed to think about. And you can go back on the landscape the last decade. We've tried to do it with, you know, one SIM and, and two sets of apps and, you know, different um, uh, protocols and permissions. And then we tried it with two phones, you know, we, we've all carried two phones for a while, right? And then we put the two together and then we tried to, so we've been at this problem in various forms for a decade. So it's not new news, but I do think the idea of moving up the stack from the physical phone, the network, the, the uh, passwords, policies, and permissions to you know getting world-class surveillance and the kinds of things that a head of state um, would get 
and bring that down to an affordable level, like that's, that's real. It's magic. And when you look at the team, you know, the team has a history of doing this. They have the qualifications to do it. They have a really good architecture to do it and they have a scalable approach. And so if you look at, at that and say, okay, you know, how does that work? I think it works really well. I think there's a really great need and the uncertainties will play out just like every company adapting. You know, does it come first for an iPhone or an iPad and is it an Android and how much do you charge for it? And um, Saatchi and team will figure that stuff out. I just am really excited that it's the, uh, a need in the market and it's an approach that's new. You put those two together and that's the sort of magic that can converts innovation into a commercial success. So I'm, I'm op really optimistic about uh, Sunday and what we're going to be doing. So John, I want to close by just telling you a story. I don't think I ever told you that. I have a feeling you probably enjoy. But um, there was a meeting I went to back during my AT&T tenure. I went to some meeting in Dallas. I forget who, who was there. Financial people, a bunch of people I, I didn't really know. And I remember I walked in, I put my stuff down. And it was shuffling around before the meeting started. But I could, I could hear what everybody was saying. And one guy pointed over and said, who's that guy? And the guy next to him said, that's one of Donovan's guys. And they all looked over at me like almost with like a little respect and all. And I remember thinking, I freaking loved that. Like I, I remember thinking that was a really good feeling that I could walk in there and they're like, that's one, that's one of Donovan's. A, a little bit like fear, a little bit of respect. That's like my, my two favorite emotions, right? So it was, it was really good. I, I don't well, know if I told you that, but that was- a, No, you didn't. And I, I think it's funny. And the, the fact, if it's, um, if it's a thing, you have that for the rest of your life. Because um, you know, I always viewed you as the guy with the halo on. So um, you have a lifetime membership in being that's one of Donovan's guys, if that's if I'll, that's wear the, I'll wear the pin with pride, that's for sure. But hey, listen, it was really wonderful that you you we covered a large range of topics. I, I have a feeling you could probably sit there for eight hours and give advice on almost anything. It's really pretty impressive. But listen, on behalf of our whole team at Tag Cyber and people watching, and uh, I suspect a lot of our old AT and T colleagues will probably be. Um, enjoying our discussion as well. I want to thank you for your time. Thanks for the NSTAC service, all the work you do on boards and good luck with the investments um, and definitely good luck with uh, Sunday security. I, I agree. I think the prospects there are very bright. So again, thanks so much for your time, John. Thank you, Ed. And if I can be helpful for you, with you, around you anyway, please don't hesitate. You bet. And for everybody else watching, we'll see you all next time.